Minnesota House of Representatives Higher Education Finance and Policy Committee to order. Well, welcome to our committee today. I, um, I really enjoyed our conversations yesterday, and I had feedback that people even watching us enjoyed it as well. So that was um, pretty cool to get to know each other a little bit better and how we had all different experiences, but how we had a lot of similarities as well and how it did impact our family's lives. And that's a that's the, such an honor to be able to be on a committee where we are um, a part of setting policy and financial commitments to higher education and how we are contributing to um, people's hard work and the education and changing their lives and their families' lives and our state. So thank you for all being here today and for the work that you do. So we do have a quorum present, which is great. And I want to know if anybody would like to make a motion to approve the minutes for January 22nd, 2019. So moved. Okay. Thank you, Representative Wolgamot. And is there any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 The mo those opposed? The motion prevails. So we have um, some special guests with us today, mm -hmm. and our next presentation will be from President Stephanie Hammett from the Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College. Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College is a unique institution created by the Minnesota Legislature in eight, 1987 and chartered as a tribal college by the Fond du Lac Band that same year. President Hammett, welcome to the committee. Come on, come on up. And we also have more members with us today, um, testifiers, Dr. Robert Peacock. He's a Fond du Lac elder. He works with the college. And Anita Hansen, the Dean of Student Services. Welcome to our committee. Uh, President Hammett, would you like to, who would like, who would like to start? President, I, President I Hammett, would you like to proceed? Thank sure. you. Sure, Okay. If you could introduce your name and your title to the committee. Sure. Thank you. Um, Uju Gekinewia Stephanie Nien Nindij Nikaz. Gawin Mache Nien Anishinabe Wini Kazosi. Makwa Nien Nindudem Nagachuanang Ishko Nagani Indonjiba. Hello, everyone. My name is Stephanie Hammett. Um, I am the uh, interim president at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College. My clan is the Bear, and I am from the Fond du Lac Reservation. Uh, Chair Bernardi and committee members, thank you for having us here today. Um, we always like to uh, tell our story and share what we do, so we appreciate this time. Um, as you've mentioned, I have uh, Dr. Peacock with me and, and Dean Hansen, and also um, Trustee Mo from the Board of Trustees is in the audience to offer support. Um, we just want to, uh, we have a present, uh, PowerPoint presentation and um, if there are questions, feel free to jump in and, and we will, three of us will try our best to answer. Um, so, our mission is to provide higher education opportunities in a welcoming, culturally diverse environment. The college's staff also came together a few years ago and identified five core values that we use as guiding principles in our daily work on our campus to help fulfill this mission. They are respect, integrity, stewardship, innovation, and compassion. We also have a vision statement that states we offer a post-secondary education to honor the past for those living in the future, in the present, through a spirit of respect, cooperation, and unity. This statement is very important to me as we work to continue our former president's visions. I also can't help but think that more than 30 years ago when my father sat on a task force that helped decide the need for Fond du Lac Tribe and Community College, if you ever thought I'd be here with all of you and in this position. FDLTC is a unique institution and the only one of its kind in the United States. We are both a tribal and state college. We are part of the Minnesota State Colleges and University System and the American, in American Indian Higher Education Consortium of Tribal Colleges. This arrangement sometimes presents a dilemma of sorts. Sometimes we are not Indian enough and sometimes we are too Indian. In the end, however, 
The unique partnership between the Fond du Lac Band and the state is a wonderful, ever unfolding experiment, a union of cultures in which no one is asked to sacrifice their identity, yet each strive toward the same goal of becoming a better person through a post-secondary education. The partnership, not necessarily easy or simple. Instead, it is one that must be grounded in the faith that we can each become better by walking together. One whose history will show that by choosing what may be the more difficult path, we've created something so, spe so special for those who follow. We could not do what we do without the support of both parties. Um, Fond du Lac's American Indian Studies Program is accredited by WINHEC, the World Indigenous Higher Education Consortium. WINHEC accreditation specifically recognizes that our college and programs are framed by the philosophies of the native communities we serve and uphold a set of cultural standards established by community and, and those that are important to our community. We are also the only community college approved by the Minnesota legislature to offer a four-year baccalaureate degree. We are in the process of developing the third and fourth year curriculum for our elementary ed program. Um, in 2017, in a 2017 Minnesota Department of Education publication, it was noted that less than half of 1% of all of about 60,000 Minnesota teachers are American Indian. We hope to change that statistic by teaching teachers how to teach the Indian learner. Currently, we are in partnership with Winona State, and they provide the third and fourth year courses to students right on our campus through ITV and through um, other technological um, robots and such. So it's very interesting. Our student population is made up of a headcount of 1,011. Of that total, 76% were classified as underrepresented, meaning our students are either non-white or Pell eligible or first generation. This underrepresented population is 23% higher than other colleges within the Minnesota state system. These numbers bring challenges, <coughs> but also great reward. We have a number of initiatives on campus that all hope to lead to successful students. We have consistently graduated the highest or nearly the highest number of American Indian students within the Minnesota state system each year. Currently, we have about 25% of our population is, is uh, Native American. Um, also, the college is part of the Achieving the Dream program. This program aids in setting goals for the college and providing coaches to help us meet our objectives. The goals of all of these projects all focus on student success. <coughs> Currently, we um, are working with three projects, mandatory orientation, mandatory attendance pilot, and the midterm grade pilot. All of these approaches hope to de decrease the percentage of students failing to make satisfactory academic progress, create better connections between the student and staff or faculty, and help lead to better student retention. The pilot projects have created a more formal, formal focus effectively serving first year students. Our faculty have been an invaluable resource in these efforts, and after seeing preliminary results from fall semester, have asked to expand the involvement to a larger group than those participating in the pilot projects. Data gathered indicates that the work has contributed to overall student success. The number of students participating in the mandatory orientation showed 73% achieved a GPA of over 2.0. That is much higher. In the past, we've, we've um, there's about three quarter, or two-thirds of our students only make a 2.0 um, first year. So hopefully these, um, or combination of all these initiatives are contributing to that increase. Um, the mandatory attendance pilot has shown that attendance does drop off in the first five to six weeks. Due to this knowledge, we now know when we need to intervene and find a way to keep students engaged. Even though we are a smaller campus, we are fortunate to have staff and faculty that care, and that is really what we pride ourselves in. We are also fortunate to have grant opportunities based on our tribal college status to provide services we may otherwise not be able to provide. We have a social worker, an e-learning specialist, and soon a retention specialist and counselor that will be on staff to help us with all of these projects. 
Another initiative not mentioned included in the PowerPoint is our College Connect program. This focuses on area high schools and we bring students that um, are not necessarily at the top of their class, but we bring students to the college. Um, they participate all semester with math and um, English faculty and, and I guess you could call little workshops um, and, and it gets them to believe that college can be for them. Um, last December, a group of <coughs> staff was invited to listen to readings of essays that those students wrote. Um, they were very, very personal stories that were shared. They were emotional and, and very um, raw, explaining how they got to where they were now. And I think there wasn't a dry eye, dry eye in the house when, when they were reading, so Anita can <laughs> testify to that. <clears throat> we do a lot of great things at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College and truly make a difference in the lives of our students. It is a place like no other, and there's no other place I would want to work. We have much to look forward to, including a small building project approved last year by the legislature and a HEPR project to redo flooring in phases across the campus. We're, um, we moved into the campus in 1992, and really there were a couple expansions, but we haven't really done some replacement things, and, and I think it's time to do that. So we're looking forward to that, and, and uh, Hope, uh, maybe you can all come up and visit and walk through the campus for a tour. Um, the final slide includes testimonial from a previous graduate who's now teaching on campus and pictures. Go ahead. No, you can go. Go ahead with that. It's just a short few seconds. Um, now the rest of the presentation are some slides and activities um, that uh, happen across campus throughout the year. Uh, this, this particular one is a picture of the flooring that we hope to have. There's some terrazzo and some Ojibwe patterns in the floor. Um, we're really looking forward to that. And then uh, we have a um, annual Christmas holiday party. There's uh, study tables. That, I think that's our academic late night. Um, each each year uh, or each semester before the end of the semester, we have faculty, tutors, uh, other staff that um, help the students get prepared for finals. Um, the upper right picture is we had the board of trustees on campus for a dinner in September and. That's one of the robots that is used in our elementary ed program. Um, we also have an annual pumpkin run walk every year, and, and the participants uh, dress up in costume and, and have some fun that day. And a picture of a student that uh, she's doing some, uh, she participated in an a internship at uh, Alabama, Alabama Huntsville. And, um, through NASA and she continues that work and is now, uh, I think she won first prize. I don't recall mm -hmm. the, um, the event, but she won first prize amongst all participants and including four-year institutions. And she's working with a researcher at uh, the University of Minnesota right now. So um, that's pretty exciting too. But those are, yep. and just further, Further pictures of the happenings on campus, and you can see a little bit of our, of the, well, we think it's a beautiful place, and it's, you can't describe the feeling when you walk in and, 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 uh, and are there. So I, I really, I really hope you can come and visit. And that's, that's outside our, our amphitheater in the winter. It's a special place, so. Mm -hmm. Um, but thank you so much for inviting us here and having us here, and we'd be happy to, happy to answer any questions. Or I've done all the talking, and maybe they would like to they would like to add. So, but thank you, thank you, President Hammett. We um, do have some questions. Did you, either of our two testifiers want to add something 
briefly to the testimony that's already made? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Robert Sonny Peacock. I added Sonny because that was my nickname. And uh, it, it sounded, um, well, it was two reasons. One, it didn't sound as formal as Barry. And secondly, uh, people kept confusing me with my father and uh, when I was running for election many years ago and they thought it was my dad running and uh, he wasn't enrolled. Well, he's enrolled in Redcliffe, not in uh, Fond du Lac. But I think of coming here, I used to uh, come down here quite a, quite a bit and bother uh, Senator Roger Moe. And there was a time when he said that if he ever became the top uh, man in the state that I could uh, be the top Indian. And so I voted for him. <laughs> and, and, I, and I've not voted since. <laughs> Um, now, now I still have to work with Roger. He's, uh, he's over with, uh, Minnesota state and, uh, he's still one of our bosses, but it's, uh, it's sort of fun, uh, being able to recollect and uh, go through remembrance of some of the times and some of the faces and some of the people. And it's good to see new faces here also. What I wanted to tell you, I think, is that uh, there was a, a brief slide that talked about the uh, scholarship fund. And when the, uh, and, and it's available to American Indian students that make an application and they have to put their photograph in and also a bio. And I sit on that scholarship committee and I get a chance to read about where these students are coming from and the things that they have to go through to get there, to get into college itself. And I look at what we offer at Fond du Lac, and it's not only to the American Indian students, but it's to all students. And if you haven't been there yet, you have to show up because there's a spirit about our place that is shared not only with the students, but also with the faculty and the staff and I don't know how to describe it except to tell you that when you come there and are welcome there and spend a little bit of time with us, you're going to leave there a whole different person with a new perspective on what education is and what the value of education can be to people who otherwise would not have that opportunity to achieve it. We are there for students who wouldn't be in school. A good many of our students are non-traditional. They're older, some grandmas, many uh, women with children that are coming in and trying to find time to come to school, get an education, work and raise children. We have young people coming in that have no clue what the real world is like. They don't have any idea of what is in the world. And I'm talking, they don't know countries or governments from anything. They've never been there. They haven't been exposed to it. And they get their exposure from coming in and getting an education from us and what little we have. As for the American Indian students with the high dropout rate, high poverty rate, we go back to the basics. That's one of the reasons why we worked so hard to get accredited by WinHEC, was because they allowed us and gave us permission. It was always ours, but somebody giving you something that you always had but you didn't really know you had, then you take that and you go with it because it works. And if someone can do that, can open that door, turn on that light for any one of you or your children or the people you represent, then you're going to have that satisfaction of knowing that you were a participant in that person's life long after you passed on to other things. 
So I'm glad that you invited us here and I uh, appreciate it. And I hope to see you again. And it's, and it's been fun. Sorry, Roger. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Peacock. Um, Anita Hansen, did you have anything to add? Um, I didn't realize uh, just what Steph had got me into coming today with you, and I'm, I'm quite honored, almost to tears on my drive down. Uh, Steph and I, um, she's a Fond du Lac and Rolly. I'm a White Earth and Rolly. Sonny's a Fond du Lac and Rolly. And, and who would have thought the three of, three of us would be here presenting to you today? We're quite honored. Um, part of what, what uh, our mission at the college, and Sonny talked a bit about it, um, is really helping our American Indian students to succeed, to reach the goals that they have set for themselves. And a lot of that, um, a lot of those goals, Steph talked about with regard to mandatory orientation, um, our, our new initiatives with regard to student success, um, having about a half day's worth of um, educating those students that don't quite have the, the skills that Sunny talked about. Um, some of the data that we've seen at the end of fall semester is that we had 35 new students, new American Indian students start in the fall. Of that 35, we've got over 70% of them are re planning to return to spring, which is a huge thing for us, um, just in terms of retention. Um, and so ultimately, we'll know hopefully next fall just how much our initiatives around student success have made a difference to those students. And um, it's, it's, it's really why we're there. I, I think this last slide that you see is our college graduation. Um, if, if you've never had a chance to be there, I would uh, highly recommend that you participate because of what you, what, what, what you feel when you get into the building on that evening. Students and the pride that they have walking across the stage, staff and faculty in attendance, um, the whole evening is, is really what, what we're at the college for. And uh, you'll get a sense of just what the campus means to everybody by attending that. So thank you again for having me and us here. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, and you're welcome. We appreciate you being here. Representative Pryor. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Bernardi. Um, I have maybe just two questions, if that's all right. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Please. Thank you. So my uh, first question is, if if you would, I'd like to hear more about um, how you've extended, or you're in the process of of, of the four-year degree now, and. Um, that it's the teachers, um, teaching certificates, and and um, uh, teacher training. So, so nobody have people graduated now in that program, or are in the program now? Uh, we had a um, Dr. Peacock. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, Yes, uh, not in the partnership uh, at this time with Winona. So that's a new program, a new cohort. In fact, over the last decade plus, we've graduated over 50 American Indian students out of our teacher education program. And many of those, in fact, they're all working if they want to. Mm -hmm. Some have gone on to become principals, superintendent. One is a superintendent. <laughs> Many of them uh, have come back and worked in Fond du Lac Reservation and are working, at, a couple of them are working at the college and teaching at the college. So that's been a highly successful program, but um, we've received funding from the federal government to cover the majority of the cost of that program. Now we are uh, finishing another cohort in partnership with Winona but with that partnership, we're trying to parallel uh, the development of our program and with the college program, our program meaning this federal Winona Fond du Lac program with uh, Fond du Lac Winona and ultimately Fond du Lac teacher training with the four-year degree program. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take a few years yet. Representative Pryor. Yes, and so I thank you for your comments. Um, thank you, Chair Bernardi, that because um, this we recognize this is a, a high priority and a high need in our state is to increase the number of teachers of color and from different backgrounds. And so um, it's good to know and to, to know also if there's ways specifically that we can support 
the program and, and what you're doing right now. So we appreciate your being here. Well, and we really appreciate your being here too, just in general. This is a great presentation. So I heard, um, Chair Bernardi, if I may, one more question. Yes. Uh, several invitations to come visit. So like, how far is it? <laughs> well, it, it is uh, about President well, Hammett. depending, I'm sorry, <laughs> depending on how fast you drive, I, I made it here, I made it here in about two hours today, so, <laughs> yeah, right up 35. Representative Norness. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to mention that I visited the campus. Um, it's been a few years ago, and I do remember how unique it was and how special it was. Uh, and it seemed to me they also had a limited amount of space to grow, and I don't know if that's been resolved or not. And I don't remember a gymnasium, so that may have been built after I'd visited up there. So the question I've got, uh, I remember testimony in probably education, K-12, talking about language and how concerned some were of certain languages disappearing. Is, is that a part of your program up there where uh, your native language is, is part of the curriculum, if maybe an elective. Mm -hmm. Can you respond to that? Mm -hmm. President Hammett. Um, Chair and uh, board member, we, we do have uh, Anishinaabe language uh, uh, four semesters that we, that we teach. Um, there is also through a Title III grant that we have, we um, have a language immersion academy every year and, and Dr. Peacock is, is uh, oversees that with a group of others and, and that is something that's very important to us and I wish I knew more. I, one of our um, instructors who, who passed away about a year ago taught me the, the, my introduction and, and I wish I could have learned more but um, I still have time so <laughs> I, will, I will do that. And, and the, going back to your comment about the, the campus, we are pretty much landlocked there. We had, uh, there was, uh, I want to say about 40 acres that uh, Potlatch Company donated to us. And um, we still have a little bit more to, to that where we could expand um, the, our original footprint that we had for the, for the building. Um, and the, the um, gymnasium, I think that was finished in about 2008, um, and then um, the the small um, the smaller uh, bonding project that we have will uh, also create an outdoor classroom, and and um, it's it's not it's not like a full structure, but just the preliminary plans uh, and what we can do there. I think will it'll be very unique, and hopefully it'll be a, a you know something that everybody will enjoy. Uh, as part of that, we're going to be renovating a couple of classrooms as well. And those are uh, primarily for the elementary ed program. Have some flexibility, being able to do different modules in, in, in those classes and have uh, some technology upgrades. And, and then um, just, some, just some minor minor other renovations across campus. Madam Chair, I would just add again Nornes. that this campus has a very unique architecture and, and it's, it's a one of a kind. So I'd urge you to put it on the plan to drive up there sometime. That would be great. And we have... Uh, Madam? Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Peacock. I, in addition to that, I want to say thank you to the state of Minnesota because with Title III, that's partial funding. It's the Dakota Ojibwe language program that's funded by the state of Minnesota that funds the other portion of our language immersion. And so the state has already stepped forward in these areas and we've been successful uh, year after year with putting this on. The change up this year is that we're, we're, we're turning the program more towards uh, what they would call a language nest. A language nest was first conceived by the Maori people in New Zealand and secondly by the Hawaiians. And we're wanting to bring that concept here to Fond du Lac. It starts with babies and toddlers. And the whole idea is that if we can bring the Ojibwe language and English together so that the, when the child begins early childhood into going to school, they will be bilingual at that time. Not unlike you see in the Southwest where children going to school have both Spanish and English. 
and uh, those children have proven to be uh, well more balanced and adapted and more successful as they go through school. Thank you. And we have two uh, questions left, and that is Representative Kwam. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm not sure who, um, about a decade ago, I was involved with a program that University of Washington and IBM and other uh, companies, there was the at-risk factor for high school students going into college. And many of uh, the participants uh, were Native American. And it basically, I, I, I taught like a math course. So I got used to a college course, but they got used to living on their own. So there's somebody helped with budgeting, helped with uh, meal planning and all the other things that you do once you start out on your own. They uh, you know, counseled a little bit about uh, different life aspects. And that was a very, I thought a very good program because uh, a lot of students, especially, um, you know, if they're traveling away, need to learn what it's like to be out on their own outside the family. And I was wondering, you talked about retention. Are there any programs or do you have an idea of some programs we maybe could try to assist in that effort so that it's not the shock of those changes causing, you know, it, they can focus on the school and, and be more successful? A, a lot. Nita Hansen. Go, ahead. Go proceed. Yep. Okay. Nita Hansen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we're we're kind of in the midst of of a lot of discussion in terms of what what are the best ways to serve you know serve our brand new students who are coming in um, and or the returning students as well. And in relation to the to brand new students, our first year experience committee that we have has spent about a year discussing. Um, whether or not it's feasible for the college to, to offer a first year experience course that would have a lot of the, the types of content that you, you discussed um, within that course. Um, we, we offer a TRIO program on campus, so a lot of our at-risk students are, are being um, applying for that program, getting into the program where they have added supports in place, um, staff members that are regularly connecting with them, um, making sure that they're getting to class, if they need any ed added support in terms of tutors, um, financial, those sorts of things. I think right now with our participation in the Achieving the Dream um, initiative, the goal ultimately is to get to the point where we, we identify just who our students are that are uh, needing those added supports and in, in what we want to do on, on the back end. I think the mandatory orientation, our attendance project, the midterm grades gives us the opportunity to identify our at-risk students um, so that we can do our best to, to put supports in place that, that help them to succeed, whether it be tutoring, whether it be counseling, whether it be social work or, or any of our um, area resources just trying to give the student the, the support that they need to be successful. Thank, thank you, and Representative Lilly. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, I think a couple of years ago, I was on had an opportunity to get up on your campus with the capital investment tour, and Representative Nornis is correct. It's a beautiful campus. I remember getting off the bus and the trees and just the nice fresh air, and then uh, of that and then getting inside and seeing your beautiful uh, atrium, if it will, or the building. But the, the neatest thing was the students really seem to be in a, a good place and happy and uh, a thriving. So congratulations to the work you're doing up there. So thank you. Thank you, Representative Lilly. Well, I want, oh, did you want to, go ahead, yeah. President. Would you like to comment, you. President Hammett? I, I also wanted to, to mention that we do a, uh, we have a, a week-long academy prior er, in August, and it's primarily for our housing students, um, right around 90 students, and they they learn some. You know, we can't do a whole lot in a week, but <laughs> we do try and touch on those same things. They they make um, meet with faculty, talk about um, you know how we communicate via email or, or that kind of thing. Um, different activities, sort of some bonding 
kind of teamwork activities as well. <coughs> um, and so that that this just this past year has been beefed up a little bit more, trying to to be a little more um, intentional on on some of those things that that you had mentioned. So uh, we we do try and do that as well. So thank you. Okay, on the glitch. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for um, coming today, and we did invite all the tribal colleges. It didn't fit into the other schedules, so we were glad we had representation from one tribal college, and I've heard wonderful things about your college, and you shared so many um, important things today, and I really appreciate you being here today, and thank you for your service and educating our students in Minnesota. Thank you very much. So next up is a presentation from the Minnesota Private College Council. The Minnesota Private Council represents 17 private, nonprofit higher education institutions in Minnesota, here to present and share their vision, mission, and goals and challenges facing Minnesota private colleges. We have Paul Kirkvenek, and you're going to have to help me with that, president of Minnesota's Private College Council. Paul Pribino, president of Augsburg College, and Dr. Bergman, no, Becky Bergman, president of Gustavus Adolphus College. And I, pro I apologize if I didn't give you the credentials that you have earned, so you'll have to um, share those with us as well. So thank you very much for being here, and welcome to the committee. And I'm sorry I don't have your names um, pronounced probably correctly, but Mr. Sir <coughs> Cirque Venick. Cirque Venick. Yes. Cirque yes. Cirque Cirque Venick. Cirque Venick. I was doing an I at the end. So anyway, um, yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't know. Um, so would you like to, were you planning on starting? Thank you and welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Paul Cirque Venick. I'm the president of the Minnesota Private College Council. I'm joined today by Paul Pribino, the president of Augsburg University, and Rebecca Bergman, the president of Gustavus Adolphus College. We want to thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today about Minnesota's private nonprofit colleges. And I want to say I know that um, uh, many House members made it over to the Rotunda this morning to visit with our students for their annual Scholars Day at the Capitol, including some of you here in the committee. And uh, I just want to say we really appreciate your taking the time and the opportunity to visit with, with our students and hear about their undergraduate research projects. The Minnesota Private College Council is comprised of 17 member institutions who all share three essential qualities. All are private nonprofit institutions, all are committed to providing a four year liberal arts education, and all have missions that serve a fundamentally public purpose, which I would summarize as providing high quality educational opportunities that prepare students for success in a career and in life and for service and leadership in their communities. Our schools receive no state higher education appropriations for operating or capital support. Only a small share of the state higher education budget, about 3% benefits our students who are eligible to receive need-based financial aid through the Minnesota State Grant Program. Although each of Minnesota's private colleges are relatively small in size, Taken together, they have a large collective impact for our state. In total, our schools serve more than 57,000 students. More than 41,000 of our students are undergrads and 68% of our undergraduate students are Minnesotans. The students, the following are some facts about the students we serve. 25% of our undergraduate students are students of color. For comparison purposes, 23% of last year's high school, Minnesota high school graduates were students of color. 20% of our students are first generation, 13% are enrolled part-time, and 12% are non-traditional students, meaning they're age 25 or older. Six of our colleges offer evening, weekend, and online degree completion programs designed specifically for working adults. And 22% of new entering freshmen are transfer students. The largest share of these transfers, about 42%, come from Minnesota community and technical colleges. Our collective four-year graduation rate of 67% is not only the highest in Minnesota and the Midwest, but it's among the highest in the nation. 
Compared on a state-by-state -state basis to private nonprofits in other states, the average four-year graduation of Minnesota's private colleges ranks third in the nation. We emphasize on-time graduation because graduation rates, graduating on time is one of the most effective ways to hold down the cost of college and minimize student borrowing. A fact that is not well understood about our colleges is that a substantial share of the students we enroll come from lower income families. 27% of our students receive Pell Grants, meaning they are generally from families with incomes between zero and $40,000. The share of low income students at our colleges is the same as at the four year universities in the Minnesota state system. We're proud not only of our commitment to enrolling lower income students, but also our commitment to their educational success. Our member institutions have the highest share of Pell Grant recipients graduating in four years in Minnesota. And when compared nationally, we rank first for our four-year graduation rate of Pell Grant students. Annually, our colleges produce about 30% of the four-year degrees granted in Minnesota and about 43% of the master's level degrees granted. And we produce an even larger share of degrees granted in some critical fields of study that are listed on the slide. I'd like to say a little bit about affordability at our colleges. 95% of our first year students receive financial aid that does not have to be paid back. This is possible because our colleges annually award more than $600 million in institutionally provided scholarships, grants, and tuition discounts. By comparison, our students receive about $49 million in state grants and about $53 million in Pell and other federal grant aid. In other words, our colleges provide students about $6 of grant aid for every dollar of combined state and federal grant aid received by our colleges. The net result of our commitment to financial aid and budget restraint in our colleges is that the average net tuition the price first year students actually pay is about $15,000. Finally, I'd like to say a little bit briefly about the Minnesota State Grant Program. Just as our institutional aid helps keep college affordable, so does the Minnesota State Grant Program. One in four Minnesota students at all colleges, public and private, receive state grants. The slide lists the most important outcomes from investing in the state grant program. As you all know, there are large income disparities and education disparities in our society. A national study has found that 58% of students from families in the top income quartile obtain a four-year degree by age 25, but only 11% of students from families in the lowest income quartile do so. The state grant program is a highly effective way to address Minnesota's education disparities and workforce challenges because it targets the state's limited resources to the students who most need help with tuition costs and student debt and who face the biggest challenges to completing a degree. So let me finish by saying thank you for the investment the legislature makes in the state grant program. The program makes a tremendous difference for students at all institutions, both public and private, and our students in our colleges are grateful for the support the legislature gives to this program. Now I'd like to pass the microphone to my two presidents who are here. Thank you very much. And I want you to introduce yourself with your credentials. And um, I usually say that to introduce you, but I'm going to let you do it. And um, we're going to start with the president of Augsburg College, I mean, Augsburg University. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Paul Pribinow, the president of Augsburg University, and it's a real honor to be with you today. Um, this is my 13th year as president at Augsburg, and um, uh, many times that I've come before this committee and uh, the Senate committee, of, and are so grateful for both your, uh, the opportunity to share with you the work that we do, but also to be able to lift up the, 
uh, in some ways, the, the rich and robust character of higher education in this state. Uh, for me to listen to our colleagues from the tribal colleges just reminds me what a remarkable complementarity we have of institutions both within the private colleges but also within the Minnesota State and University of Minnesota systems. And so I, I'm very grateful for that. And there are many ways, in fact, that we work together across those boundaries. And I think that that's a, uh, says something about uh, our deep commitment as a state to higher education. Um, I show you this picture to begin, um, because even though you've, many of you know our campus, which is located in Cedar Riverside in the heart of Minneapolis, the most diverse zip code between Chicago and Los Angeles, one of the things that uh, we've started as an institution is a program called the River Semester, and this is um, our students uh, who spend an entire semester, uh, 15 students and two faculty members, uh, traveling the Mississippi River from St. Paul all the way to New Orleans, um, where they take three courses, a biology course, a political science course, as well as an independent study while on the river. Um, and for me, that's a sign of uh, innovation in teaching, which is just a, an example of what happens uh, across our institutions where we are constantly thinking about how we can engage students more fully in enhancing the educational experience they have. Uh, if you'd like to come back to college, we do it every fall. Uh, it's an opportunity to be on the river for an entire semester. Um, which uh, this past fall was very difficult because it rained, there were tornadoes, uh, it was quite, a, quite an experience for our students, life changing I would say. Just a word about our mission. Um, so Augsburg uh, has this uh, very clear mission statement that one of the things about colleges and universities, we can't stop ourselves from adding words. So um, if you read the, the large print, we educate students to be informed citizens, thoughtful stewards, critical thinkers, and responsible leaders. Um, but we also do that in a context. And so you read there that the Augsburg experience is supported by an engaged community um, committed to intentional diversity in its life and work. And that is a key phrase for us, a part of our mission statement since the late 1980s. Um, defined by excellence in both the liberal arts and professional studies, our largest programs at Augsburg are programs in business and in nursing and in social work, but we are at the core at a liberal arts institution as our, our partners in the Minnesota Private College uh, Council. Uh, guided by the faith and values of the Lutheran Church, very proud of that tradition, but at the same time, as you'll hear in a moment, uh, now one of the most diverse private colleges in the country um, as a result, I think, of how we've thought about how that tradition actually makes us a welcoming, hospitable uh, place committed to, uh, to all of our students and shaped very much by our urban uh, and our global settings. And this is important, a deeply urban institution and in the heart of a major city with also a presence around the world. We have campus sites, permanent campus sites in Mexico, in Nicaragua, uh, in Namibia, and we are just opening um, a new campus site in Bethlehem in Israel. So um, a very important part of our life is our commitment to those, uh, those sites around the world. We have a vision statement, which is very pithy, um, uh, that we are a new kind of student-centered urban university small to our students and big for the world. And that is a very important part, and I think you'll hear the same thing from my colleague from Gustavus, places that are very much about community, about personal relationships between students and faculty uh, and staff, uh, but at the same time with the aspiration that their graduation from our institutions will lead them to do remarkable things in the world. So small to our students and big for the world. In a few months from now, Augsburg will begin its uh, celebration of its sesquicentennial, um, its 150th anniversary. So in 1869, some intrepid uh, Norwegian pioneers came to this part of the country and decided that they wanted to found institutions like ours to, uh, to teach uh, teachers and preachers for their communities. Um, 150 years later, we are a very different place, but we still uh, honor, in fact, those founding traditions which have become a part of our history throughout our time uh, in, in Minneapolis. And let me just uh, name those traditions very quickly. First is a particular faith tradition. As I mentioned earlier, our Lutheran tradition, which has, uh, which we share with Gustavus. Uh, they're the Swedes, we're the Norwegians, but uh, we're very proud of the fact that that tradition has shaped us and given us a focus. One thing I would say about that is that has actually also led to the other distinctions that we have. One is an academic mission, which yes, honors uh, classroom work and, and certainly uh, labs work and things that happen on campus, but it's always been connected to experiential education, very taking advantage of our location, whether it's around internships or undergraduate research or service learning, many of these practices that really uh, take our students out into the city and beyond and connect that back to their classroom work. So a distinctive academic mission. Um, certainly, as I mentioned earlier, our urban location in the heart of a community where we are surrounded by immigrants, uh, our Somali, 
um, Hmong, uh, Vietnamese, Korean, Ethiopian immigrants who are our neighbors, uh, an important aspect of our day-to-day -day life. I like to think about them as our extended faculty because when our students are in that neighborhood, they're constantly engaging folks who have different life experiences, different faith traditions, different perspectives on the world that help to enhance the education that we offer. Um, and then finally, the other distinction is our public calling. Um, uh, Augsburg has always been a place with a deep commitment to social justice and to um, a progressive agenda, if you will. Uh, early on uh, in our history, back in the 1880s, Augsburg uh, faculty were some of the biggest supporters of the growth of public education. Uh, one of my predecessors as president served on Hubert Humphrey's mayoral commission on civil rights in the 1940s. Uh, we went into North Minneapolis in the late 60s and early 70s with important educational programs. We are in the prisons, actually providing, uh, still today, providing uh, opportunities for prisoners, inmates to pursue uh, academic degrees. All of those as signs, I think, of, of the kind of deep commitments at the heart of the institution to a public calling. So today, one of the things that uh, I would focus on is uh, the nature of our student body. Um, so we have about 3,500 students total um, on a little 20-acre campus uh, there in the heart of Cedar Riverside. About 2,000 of those students are traditional undergraduates. Um, about uh, 500 of them are adults uh, pursuing uh, undergraduate degrees. That happens both on our Minneapolis campus as also on a campus in Rochester where we've been for 22 years. Uh, and then we have about 1,000 graduate students um, in about 10 or 11 different graduate programs. That's a significant change for Augsburg since the 1980s, but it gives you a sense of how we've responded to the needs of uh, the folks here, here in the Twin Cities in particular. It makes us different than some of our uh, partner institutions, uh, but it is a way that I think uh, the relevance of, uh, of our private colleges is, is shown in how we've responded. Um, in particular for Augsburg, this has meant a, a, just a, a transformative uh, kind of change in our profile over the past, especially over the past decade. Um, so at this point, Augsburg is um, a majority minority at the undergraduate population. Um, so we have uh, our entering class this past fall, we're 57% students of color. Um, so many ways back to what uh, Mr. Sofranek said earlier, we are in fact um, responding to those who are in our neighborhoods, who are in our city high schools, um, and I think that has become a very important part of our life. And it's also led us into some very important work around our commitment to equity and inclusion. So we are learning from our students who come to us from these different and diverse backgrounds how we need to teach differently, how we need to respond to their uh, aspirations for their life. Um, in many ways, I would say that we are reminded by our immigrant students about uh, the power of the American dream. Um, they're helping to remind us that the things we take for granted in many of our lives, um, in fact, shouldn't be taken for granted because education still is the key, still is the key to a middle class life and beyond. And for our Somali students and for our Ethiopian students and for our undocumented students who are a part of our community, they are illustrating why education is so important to their lives. And we take that very seriously in all of the services we provide them to help them be successful uh, in their time at Augsburg and beyond. So. Uh, as we talk about it, just how do we become the university that our students need today? How do we respond to them where they are so that we can help to lead them to the kind of success that all of us have enjoyed? Um, we do that in a variety of ways. One of the programs many of you know about that we're most proud of uh, is our Step Up program, which serves students recovering from addiction. A program that was founded 22 years ago has served a very important purpose where we have about 100 students on campus who are in that program at least six months sober are mainstreamed into the life of the institution and do remarkable things as a part of the institution, but to live together and have a particular set of services. It's the gold standard in collegiate recovery in the country. Very proud of it, and it's an example of where the institution has lived out its mission. Again, where students come to us and helping them to, uh, to pursue their education. Last thing I would say is that we're also very proud of our work uh, in the neighborhood. Um, uh, as you know, the Cedar Riverside neighborhood uh, has its challenges, and I, we are so grateful for the types of support that we've received from the legislature over the many years to respond to those needs, whether it's uh, at the Brian Coyle Center, which many of you know, or through the People's Center, or through the work that we're doing together. Uh, two things that I would lift up. One is the Cedar Riverside Partnership, which is a group of the institutions and the neighborhood organizations, along with the Hennepin County and the City of Minneapolis. Um, who come to the table on a regular basis to figure out how we can be neighbor together, how we can create a more healthy and just neighborhood, and a whole variety of initiatives, including the creation of the Opportunity Center. Many of you know the Opportunity Center that was opened uh, just across the street from the Brian Coyle Center about a year and a half ago, a very important place where we're helping to respond to a very high unemployment rate uh, in the city, so it's a combination of educational institutions, employment help, 
and, and as well as the city and county, and we are finding some great success there in helping to um, decrease that unemployment rate, that especially around, around uh, young men in the, in the neighborhood. And then the last program I would lift up uh, is one that we're extremely proud of, and we are so grateful for the legislature for the support through the Q program. Um, starting about six years ago, we started the EAST program, the East African uh, Student Teacher Program. Um, now, um, really, the, uh, again, the gold standard in the country for educating uh, student te or student, the teachers from the East African community. Uh, when we graduated our first cohort, which is pictured here, um, we um, doubled the number of East African teachers in the state of Minnesota. Um, now, that isn't saying much, uh, <laughs> but we continue to pursue that year after year now with a full cohort and those students that are now going back into the schools where their um, <coughs> fellow immigrants and uh, others are studying, and those kids are seeing teachers that look like them, and we all know the impact that that can have. So this has been a very important commitment, and we are so grateful for the support we've received. So I will stop there and pass the baton to my Thank you very Colleague much. And we have uh, a little less than 10 minutes for the rest of our presentation and questions from the committee. So, um, Becky Bergman, with that challenge, I welcome you to the committee, the president of Gustavus Adolphus College. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman, and thank you to the entire committee for the opportunity to be here today to highlight some of the features of Gustavus Adolphus College that also have been highlighted by others and yet show the diversity of our 17 private colleges. Uh, I have been president at Gustavus for the last five years and had prior to that a 25-year career at Medtronic here in the Twin Cities where I was an executive in research and development. So I have seen both the private sector and now have the pri privilege of serving uh, in higher education. Uh, so uh, we uh, are in St. Peter, Minnesota, and if you don't know Gustavus, uh, we had a big tornado 20 years ago. You might have heard about that. Uh, we have an annual Nobel conference, a pretty well-attended, uh, thousands of uh, the public attending a conference on a scientific topic every fall. Uh, we have a pretty well-known summer tennis program that some of your children or neighborhood children may have attended, and we're very proud right now to have uh, a representative on your committee, Representative Samantha Vang, graduated in 2016. So uh, we have, like every other college, a mission, vision, and core values statements that are really the fundamentals of how we articulate who we are, what we do, and why we do it. Uh, our mission statement, also quite wordy, and an excerpt is here, uh, focuses on that last few words on fulfilling lives of leadership and service, uh, again emphasizing the importance of getting out into the world. Uh, we are in the process of working a strategic plan where our vision statement here focuses on equipping students to lead purposeful lives and to act on the great challenges of our time. So again, helping students to mature in their understanding of their own talents and to be able to take those out into their communities. Uh, we are, like Augsburg, uh, come from the Lutheran tradition along with uh, four total uh, private colleges of the 17 in Minnesota. We have uh, 2,200 undergraduate students. We are an undergraduate-only institution at this point, uh, residential and uh, private and liberal arts, like all of the uh, 17 um, colleges in the Minnesota Private College Council. We have 78% of our students from Minnesota. Well, that's pretty typical for us, ranges between 75 and 80% of our students year to year. We have also, like Augsburg, seen an increasing number of students from diverse backgrounds and from uh, first-generation students. Nothing like the percentage at Augsburg, but we uh, have over 20% of our students who come from historically underrepresented groups. Uh, like many of our smaller colleges, uh, we emphasize faculty-student relationships uh, that's designated here through uh, picturing the classroom of about 18 
uh, students per classroom, which allows for strong relationships with faculty and small group discussions. We would be considered a fairly selective school, uh, so our students come from uh, good credentials academically, uh, and our goal is to send them out to be leaders in society. Over 90% of our students receive some form of financial aid, and 70% of them receive some form of need-based aid, which is a growing percentage of our student population. You can see here the statistics for the number of our students receiving state grant. It's a growing number of our students uh, and now stands at 37% of our student body. Uh, the Minnesota State Grant, uh, according to our students, has allowed them to attend their college of first choice. So it does make a big difference for our students to be able to afford to go to the college that is their first choice. Gives them the opportunity to learn, and as I will tell you in a minute, gives them a chance to give back to the state. So you can see that all of our colleges would be able to brag about rankings of different kinds. Gustavus ranks, uh, and a couple that we're quite proud of, we're good stewards of your taxpayer money, and for example, in the New York Times ranking in 2017, we ranked 33rd overall uh, for the top colleges doing the most for low-income students, which is one of the things that we strive to do, make our college accessible to any student and any family. So we uh, strive to be affordable, uh, to be able to give our students a college education that does not saddle them with debt that's unreasonable. Money Magazine talks about us also being the most afford one of the most affordable private colleges and a college that adds value. That's a, then the, by that they mean a balance of cost and salary outcome for our students. Our graduation rate for our Pell eligible students is something we're also very proud of. We graduate our Pell eligible students at the same rate as our other students at about 80% uh, in four years. It's quite an amazing statistic. We are, we are driven to be sure that our students never fall through the cracks. And finally, I would just remind you that our students stay in Minnesota. Uh, we have about 20,000 Gustavus alumni who live and work in Minnesota. And if I just take the overall statistic of 37% of them who receive state grant aid, that's over 7,000 Gusty alumni who are out there doing good things in the state. All of them have a story, and all of them have <coughs> really paid attention to the educational opportunities they have had and will be good citizens of this state. So thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I turn it back to you. Thank you, President Bergman. Okay, go, uh, it looks like we have uh, Mr. Cervanic. Cervanic. Um, <coughs> would like to say something, it looks like. Nope, nope, well, nope. We're okay. happy to answer Excellent. questions, though, Madam So we have five minutes for members to ask a question, and we'll start with Representative Rumbeck. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just wondered if the two colleges, do you, do you keep, um, data on the debt load that your graduates leave with and what's the trend on that and what's the current average? We do. Um, um, we do as well as many other uh, agencies keep track of that. Um, we have kept our debt uh, uh, load, I think the average for those who have debt at Augsburg, who graduate from Augsburg is, uh, is about $28,000, which is actually lower than the state average. Um, I, I would tell you, Beyond that statistic, though, um, the important thing for us is actually to make sure that they don't get into debt that is unreasonable. I think, as, uh, as President Bergman said, this is an important part of what we're doing now on the front end, really focusing on financial literacy and working very closely with their families before they come to us to make sure that they understand and that we are making uh, responsible decisions on both sides of the equation. So it's a very important part of our uh, efforts to make sure that uh, when they go out into the world, they're not going to be saddled with debt that's going to keep them from being able to live the life they want to live. Thank you, President Tribunal, for yes, that. Yes, and very and similarly, and 25, Bergman, about $25,000 debt uh, for our, our students who take on debt at Gustavus. Okay. Thank you. Representative Lehman. Oh, 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just have to ask Mr. Cirkvenik if he's related to Gary Cirkvenik. That's my cousin. Ms. That's your Cirkvenik. cousin. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I know how to pronounce Cirkvenik. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I'm learning slowly. Uh, well, welcome. A great presentation. Really appreciated. I just had to comment. We we went around the the horn yesterday and talked about our experiences, and I just related that my. Uh, Education comes from private colleges, and um, not yours, unfortunately, but <laughs> uh, Concordia St. Paul and University of St. Thomas. And I, um, I just sing the praises of private, smaller colleges. I went there because of the culture, the faith-based uh, atmosphere, and frankly, it was more affordable um, for me. And uh, I had a great education, good experience, and I'm just so happy that we have strong private colleges here in the state of Minnesota. Um, with that, I, I uh, spent a few years teaching for the College of St. Scholastica, and one of their biggest challenges was um, students moving to the online experience for uh, their education, and fewer and fewer and fewer students going to the main campus. So the their enrollment numbers were on the decline at the main campus. Now they did outreach, so they had outreach campuses, and those numbers were growing, and the online uh, student population was growing. I'm just curious, in the private college sphere, is that a, a common trend, that you're having fewer students on campus and more online students? Okay, and we have about one minute for an answer. So President Bergman, would you like to start? Madam Chair, thank you for the opportunity. And we do we allow a few online credits, but do not have an online program. Uh, and I'll, I'll turn to the others to answer. President Pribino. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Um, we don't have uh, full online programs either. Uh, we have decided that that's a, a, there are many good providers of those. Uh, we do take some of those credits. We have actually moved toward hybrid, uh, which um, are combinations of what they call low residency programs, where students come to us for a particular more intense time, and then they do the rest of what they do throughout a several month period using um, the technology. So it's we, that's where we have found um, the best mix of wanting to have them with us and at the same time understanding the role that technology can play in providing a quality education. Madam Chair and Representative Lehman, um, across our 17 colleges, just a small number um, are really working in the online space. Those schools would include St. Scholastica, Concordia, St. Paul, and St. Mary's. Um, uh, the majority of our colleges, I think, would be typical of Gustavus and uh, Augsburg. Thank you very much. I won't take any more time. I find that really interesting. So I appreciate your response. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for being here. I learned a lot, and we appreciate what you're doing for the students in our state and for our state. So thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. Well, we have a joint presentation from the Interfaculty Organization and Minnesota State College Faculty, the IFO at MSCF represent faculty at Minnesota State's four-year and two-year colleges and universities. Uh, with us, we have IFO President Brent Jeffers and MSCF Vice President Matt Williams. Welcome to our committee, Mr. Jeffers and Mr. Williams. Please introduce yourselves, and you may begin your presentation. Who's gonna, who is going to start? <coughs> I'm sure we arm wrestled and Brent's going to go first. Okay, so, so uh, President Jeffers. Madam Chair, my name is Brent Jeffers, and I am the president of the Interfaculty Organization. I'm also an associate professor of exercise science at Southwest Minnesota State University. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce ourselves and present our organizational priorities and some of our challenges. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I'm a product of the Minn State system. I have either been a student, a head coach, a professor, in the Minnesota State System since 1980. I've earned an associate's degree from Ember Hills Community College and a bachelor's and master's degree from Bemidji State University. This is my 30th year at Southwest Minnesota State. The education I received in our system provided me a career and a middle class income that I thought was not possible when I was a senior in high school. My opportunities and successes are largely due to the investments by the state in our system 
and for that I am forever thankful. The IFO is a union that takes responsibility for excellent, accessible, inclusive public higher education in Minnesota. Collectively, we represent the interests of more than 4,000 professors, coaches, counselors, and librarians of the seven state universities within the Minn State system. As a voice for the faculty, we advocate in our communities and on our campuses for a system of higher education that best serves our students, their families, and our state. Commit to protecting academic freedom, institutional shared governance, and our right to be heard in all matters concerning the education of our students. Commit to increasing diversity and inclusiveness in our union, in our union leadership, on our campuses, through our institutional partners, and in our local communities. Support efforts to prepare students for life, careers, and citizenship. Strive for fair and competitive compensation and benefits. Provide equal, fair, and responsive representation for every person we represent, regardless of union membership. Enforce the contract ensuring its equal and fair application to all faculty. And we provide responsible stewardship of the membership dues we collect. We are proud to be faculty in the Minnesota State System. Minnesota State has the most powerful and effective resource that the state has to ensure opportunity and prosperity for its citizens and communities. Our seven universities serve as catalysts for social and economic success. They are places of hope and opportunity for Minnesotans who strive to create a better future for themselves, their families, and their communities. A strong faculty union is a key to providing the highest quality educational opportunities for our students. Many faculty represent, that we represent, invest 30 to 40 years of their professional lives teaching, advising, and being active in the communities we serve. Faculty will outlast the chancellor, the presidents, and the deans of our institution. This longevity provides us with a long-term perspective on how our universities can best prepare our students. A clear example of faculty investment in our success of our institution was in 2009, at the beginning of the Great Recession. We understood that we must be part of the solution confronting the enormous financial crisis facing our campuses. That year, we opened our bargaining session with Minnesota State with a settlement offer. That settlement offer included a pay freeze. This was a way that we could help bring some financial stability to our campuses. Those pay freezes lasted in effect for over three years. The IFO has been committed to advocating for our students in an affordable and accessible education. Prior to 1980, when some of you may have attended a state college or university, the state funded 80% of the cost of that attendance. And as you heard from the students yesterday, in the early 80s, a statute was passed that set a clear goal for the state to fund at least 67% of the cost of attendance at a state college or university. The state had fulfilled this promise for 20 years until 2003 when our campuses began to see a series of cuts over the next decade. It is clear that there is a direct correlation between the dramatic increase in student loan debt and the dramatic decrease in state funding over this time. This was not unique to Minnesota, but our state was one of the worst offenders in the country. By 2013, the state was funding approximately 33% of a student's cost of education, a complete reversal from the historic funding model. And adjusted for inflation over that time, the cost of attendance actually went down. That's how dramatic the state appropriation cuts hit our campuses. Tuitions increased throughout this decade at a dramatic pace as well, but could not keep pace to offset the cuts. Make no mistake, our quality and student success suffered and continues to suffer because of the decade of state disinvestment. However, in 2013, our organization partnered with former House Higher Education Chair Gene Pulowski to secure a fully funded tuition freeze. This was a big first step in reversing the state's investment trend. 
Over the next four years, with the leadership of past Chairman Bud Nornis, we have been able to make additional progress and now have reached almost 50% state funding, 50% tuition. We are particularly thankful for the bipartisan leadership on our issues in the Minnesota State House. Even with the progress of the past six years, our campuses continue to face budget shortfalls and cuts. The historic state appropriation of 67% <coughs> provided stability for our campuses. The stability that is needed for us to make investments in innovative new programs and to address regional workforce needs. As, he, as we have increasingly relied on unstable tuition revenue, we have lost the ability on many campuses to make those strategic investments. The biggest impact of these budget uh, shortfalls over the, the next decade will be our inability to properly address the racial and social economic achievement gaps. We must commit to providing opportunities for our current and future students, opportunities that many of us sitting in this room were provided, including me. The most effective strategy Minnesota has for narrowing the prosperity gap is to ensure all Minnesotans get an education and the education that they need to secure a better future for themselves, their families, and their communities. The diversity of our students is one of our greatest strengths. Minnesota State is proud to serve more students of color and American Indian students and more low income students than all other higher education providers in Minnesota combined. One area that is vitally important to our union is ensuring inclusive recruitment and retention uh, practices. We understand that we must engage in the recruitment and retention of faculty and staff that reflect the cultures, values, and backgrounds of the students we serve. This also means planning for the students we will be teaching 10 and 20 years from now, not just today's students. Unfortunately, because of the constant budget constraints on our campuses, we have seen many faculty positions go unfilled as our baby boomers begin to retire. These positions that if filled would help our campus achieve the necessary number of faculty and staff to meet the needs of our students. We have begun to partner with the administration on our campuses and at the system office on this important work. We have also been engaging our marginalized faculty to ensure their voices are heard and we view our mission through their lens and their lived experiences. Those conversations within our union have not always been easy, but they have been very informative as we strive to fulfill our mission of fairly representing all faculty. This session we ask for support so we can continue to do the work that we all love. None of us have gotten into this business to get rich. We do the work because we, we are keenly aware of the impact it has on our society. Our faculty are committed to partnering, partnering with you to fulfill our mission, address our challenges of our students, and make our state successful. After Matt presents, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. And our next testifier is Vice President Matt Williams. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for inviting us. Uh, I am Matt Williams, the Vice President of the Minnesota State College faculty. I'm also a very proud faculty member in the English department at Inverhills Community College, which is about 15 minutes down 52 on the road here. Minnesota State College faculty is the labor union representing faculty at the public two-year colleges in Minnesota. And I think it's important to understand a little about who we are as faculty and what makes us unique. First and foremost, we are professional educators whose primary responsibility is educating students. While all of us engage in continuous ongoing professional development to become good at educating students, we are not researchers for whom teaching is a secondary concern. Our students are what we live to do and, and the classroom is what we uh, focus on. The other thing to understand about us is we are educators who are very proud to work in public open access institutions that welcome all. As open access public institutions, we take students from high achieving high school students who are ready for the challenges of college to traditional uh, undergraduates who are ready to begin their college career, whether it's in the liberal arts or the technical fields. Uh, Non-traditional returning students uh, are often uh, part of our classes, even up to retirees who are seeking personal enrichment to read a little Chaucer, uh, for whatever reason that might be, right? And no judges, right? Um, to 
understand what environment this creates for us though. Being an open access institution, we deal with a diversity of challenges that our students bring to us that makes the environment we work in very challenging. And just as a, a brief story to kind of illustrate what this means for us, um, my first semester at Inver Hills Community College, there was a student that I worked with um, that really illustrated the type of students we see quite regularly in our classes. And I'll call her Alicia, that's not her real name, um, but just for the sake of the story, I'll refer to her as that. Um, prior to teaching at Inver Hills, I had taught at the University of Minnesota for eight years while I was working on my PhD. And the students I had at the U uh, faced challenges, they struggled just like any student in college would. But it was pretty clear that if everything fell apart, they would have some sort of safety net underneath them to catch them, for the most part. Alicia had no safety net underneath her. And the first thing I discovered about Alicia as a student is she didn't have a computer. She couldn't afford one, nor did she have internet access at her home. So she would come to campus to work in our library, to work on a computer so that she could have something to type on, because otherwise she'd have to type essays on her phone, which wasn't going to work, and to have internet access. The other uh, challenge that Alicia faced is that she was a single mother in her late 20s. And so childcare was a very real thing that she had to figure out how to deal with. She was uh, um, lucky enough to have family members who would help her, but sometimes things would fall between the cracks. Her family members had to be at work and someone couldn't help take care of her child, which would mean that she would have a hard time getting to class. Uh, another barrier that Alicia faced was inadequate transportation. The mass transit options to Inver Hills Community College and Inver Grove Heights are not super stellar. And for our 8 a.m. English class that she was a student in, uh, there was a point in the semester in which she had a flat tire, a pretty simple thing, but that made it uh, impossible for her to get to class for a couple of class sessions just because there was no other way for her to get there. She also had to work outside of school to pay for her bills, to pay for rent, to pay for food. And of course that led to struggles for her as well, uh, trying to work with a manager who would not necessarily give her time off to study, would not necessarily be understanding about what she would need to be able to stay on as a college student. And of course, the most significant barrier and challenge she faced was healthcare. Uh, her young child uh, was diagnosed with a chronic illness, and eventually that is what caused her to withdraw from the semester because she had to spend time with her child to deal with that and to pick up hours to be able to cover the costs there. These are the sorts of students that we see in our colleges, and these are the challenges and the barriers that they face. I'll come back to Alicia in just a little bit. As an organization, MSCF, our vision for higher education in Minnesota has remained remarkably consistent throughout the years. We believe in high quality higher education for all of Minnesota. We believe that access to high quality education shouldn't depend on what community you live in, what career or professional path you seek, or the wealth of the family you were born into, and it certainly shouldn't depend on factors beyond your control as a student. We believe college students in Fergus Falls or Austin or Hibbing should have the same high quality educational experience as a college student living in the metro area. And brief historical note, there are 39 campuses and the two schools spread around the state of Minnesota and they are pretty evenly spread around the state of Minnesota because that geographic access was really a part of how they came to be. This vision has been the basis for what we have sought to accomplish as a labor union. And one real quick example of this, we have a statewide contract that helps ensure the uniformity of credentials for our faculty across the state. And this is something that's incredibly important for us. Um, it, and it's helped us ensure that someone teaching English at Alexandria Technical and Community College is not held to a lower standard than someone teaching English at Normandale Community College in Bloomington. In this way, we seek to make sure that the college student in Alexandria is not valued less than the college student in Bloomington. So I return to Alicia's story here. What's important to understand about Alicia's challenge is that her challenges were not commensurate with her ability as a college student. She was a little rough around the edges, but she absolutely had potential. She absolutely could handle the rigors of college level education. And her goal as a student, and I learned this about her earlier on this semester because she shared this with me, was to earn an Associate of Arts in business so she could open her own small business so that she could provide for her family and for herself. And I hope this is a goal that we can all appreciate and respect. As for our goals and challenges, if you talk to faculty at the two-year colleges, there's one common thread you'll eventually notice. The challenges our students face, like Alicia, have become more severe and more of a barrier to educational success. Much of Alicia's cost for being a student was covered via financial aid, that would be Pell Grants, state grants, so on and so forth. But it was everything else outside the classroom, everything else just in life itself that was the barrier for her to achieve success as a college student. And her story is far from isolated. A recent survey done by researchers at Temple University have found that 46% of students at two-year schools across this country have reported some level of food insecurity. 
46% of students at two-year colleges have reported some form of food insecurity. At our own Minneapolis Community and Technical College, an informal research study done in 2010 found that one in 10 students had experienced homelessness as a student. That's 10% of their student body. 100% of our faculty have stories like this to share. And they have stories to share about students who face insurmountable and overwhelming barriers outside the classroom that prevent success inside the classroom. And I can also tell you that in talking with my colleagues around the state, these stories of the increasing challenges our students face, the stories themselves are becoming more common. More and more our students are facing the same challenges that Alicia faced as a student in my class. So our goal as an organization is to bring our expertise and our experiences as educators in the classroom who work directly with students facing these challenges into the conversation. We believe that all students deserve high quality, high education, or high quality higher education. For example, helping students cover the cost of tuition without resorting to high levels of debt is absolutely an important thing to do. But if you consider Alicia's story, her needs were so much more than just tuition. It was childcare, it was transportation, it was simply having the time in the day to focus on studying. And so one of the challenges we face is as educators in classroom, we know a lot about what works, how students can learn given these challenges. For example, one program we've been very excited about recently is the Accelerated Study in Associate Programs at the City University of New York, sometimes referred to as the CUNY ASAP program. If you're familiar with wraparound services in the K-12 world, it's something similar for higher education. So what they've done in New York City is they've provided for all of the things outside the classroom that get in the way of success in the classroom. So for example, they make sure they have structured study environments. They hook them up with uh, either social worker counselors to make sure that whatever challenges they face will be somehow dealt with. And they even give them a transit card so that they can use the mass transit to get around New York City. Basically, they are getting rid of all the barriers so that the students can focus on being a student. And guess what? It works. There's a wealth of data and research behind the program that shows that when students are able to focus on being a student, oftentimes they can overcome those barriers. But that requires for us to take a look at something like that for Minnesota to shift our mindset. And one of the first things people will talk about when they look at a program like the CUNY ASAP program is the cost, cost per student. And it is higher. It does take money to be able to support students in this way. But what they've discovered at the CUNY ASAP program, of course, is the cost per graduate goes down. And so it's a challenge for us and where we want to be in the conversation to help move that conversation toward thinking about what do we want to value here? Do we want to value the success of students or we just want to say, we gave you a chance and we're going to leave it there. Um, and so we hope that this invitation here uh, uh, is the beginning of that conversation. And we really look forward to being friends of this committee and helping share our experiences in the classroom. And with that, I'll yield it there. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I don't have any questions on the list. I think this is an efficient group. Oh, we do have one. Just, uh, sorry. Okay, Representative Brumbeck. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of, of overview, overview questions. Um, what what percent of tenured professors are are you know are there now at the in your collective? And because that's well anyway. And then roughly how many classroom hours per week of teaching on average are is the load currently for t for professors? Vice President Williams. Okay, so for the two-year colleges, uh, we actually buck the national trends when it comes to tenure track and full-time instructors. As part of our contract, 70% uh, of our FYE uh, must be tenured or tenure track, what we call unlimited status uh, professors. Compare that with the national averages, 80% of community college faculty across this country are temporary contingent part-time faculty. So we're basically the opposite because of what we have done. Uh, we believe in that because if you are able to focus on what you do in the classroom, it allows you to become much better, much faster because you're able to focus on what you're doing with students. In regard to our teaching loads, um, it's, uh, so we typically have a load of about 15 to 16 credits a semester. What that looks like is usually between four and six classes, uh, and that is a full-time load. Of course, that includes uh, office hours, working with students outside of class, grading, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but compare that with a, an institution like the University of Minnesota, where two classes a semester would be full-time, we're about double that, a little bit more. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for that question. Okay, well, thank you for your testimony. We appreciate you being here today and for your service to our students in the state. Thank you so much and to our state. So um, thank you, committee. And with that, our meeting is adjourned.